Sequels are a difficult thing to get right. Typically, when any movie sees even slight success, there's a call for a follow-up. But rarely do they ever match the magic of the original. Certainly not never. I mean, see the likes of Terminator 2 Judgment Day, The Godfather Part 2, and plenty of others for confirmation of that. But there have been a lot of stinkers too. Heck, sometimes, even when they're just good, they can run the risk of devaluing the original, either by just not being as good suffering from a weird recast, or even undermining the ending. The latter most example is what we're here to look at today. So strap in buckos, I'm Ewan, this is War Culture, and here are 10 sequels that completely undermined the previous movie's ending. Number 10, Rambo Returns to Vietnam. Rambo, First Blood, Part Two. John Rambo is up there with Rocky Balboa as one of the characters who helped make Sylvester Stallone an action megastar in the 1980s. In his first appearance in First Blood, the Vietnam veteran fought a very personal war, while battling debilitating PTSD, betrayal from the government who sent him to battle in the first place, and being made a pariah on the streets. After eventually being talked down from taking on an entire army of the authorities by himself, Rambo's situation got the better of him and he broke down. Living a civilian life had been made impossible for him, and he turned himself in, ultimately to be sent to prison. The 1972 novel by David Morrell ends on an even darker note though, with Rambo being killed by Troutman rather than being talked down from the brink. First Blood Part 2 is a different beast entirely, a gonzo 80s action fest that presents John Rambo with a chance to get his soldiering on again by the same government who betrayed him, lied to him, and kind of left him in the state that we see him in at the beginning of the first movie. He accepted the offer in a move that completely undermined the meaning of the original First Blood's ending, with Rambo happily redeployed to the jungles of Vietnam almost a decade after the United States' official withdrawal. And yet, the film, as well as its equally relic-esque follow-up, Rambo 3, kick ass. Seriously, they're both great action films. As sequels to the original, they're completely comical. But once you remove that pesky historical baggage, admire the saturated explosions on screen, and bask in a peak of his shape sly, you'll fully understand why these are two of the most iconic action films of the 1980s. Just also ones that completely corrupted what Rambo was meant to be. Number nine, the immortals were actually aliens? Highlander 2, The Quickening. The film industry is littered with ill-advised sequels that never should have happened. And at the very top of the list is Highlander 2 The Quickening. While most bad movies will have at least some redeeming factor, or someone out there who will go bat for it, a score of 0% on Rotten Tomatoes is all that needs to be said about this one. Among the issues, the many many issues, was that it came off the back of the incredibly popular Highlander and not only ignored everything that happened in that film, but actively contradicted the law already established. In the first film, Christopher Lambert's Conor McLeod was an immortal force to fight other immortals across centuries until there was just one left, who would win the prize and be gifted a mortal life. Once McLeod received this gift, there was no reason to even consider a sequel. As a story, well, it, it had been told. Instead, the quickening made canon the idea that the immortals were actually aliens for some reason, question mark? Forcing McLeod to undo his mortal life in order to fight off an invasion from their home planet. Yeah, it, it sounds ridiculous as it sounds, and it's hard to believe such a bad idea wasn't killed in production. Number eight, Jason Lives. Friday the 13th, part six, Jason Lives. Jason Voorhees, along with the likes of Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger, is one of those iconic horror movie villains who seems to keep coming back no matter what, even when he's seemingly been killed. Although, saying that, it's been like, what, 15 years since we last had a Jason movie? So, um, maybe he is like? Properly dead, dead? Anyway, after debuting in Friday the 13th in 1980, Jason made three more appearances before he was finally downed by Tommy Jarvis 
in front of the 13th, the final chapter. He was impaled with a metal fence post, and well, that was that. However, there would then be further chapters released after the quote-unquote final entry, really making a mockery of that title. After part five, Friday the 13th, A New Beginning, deviated from Jason and focused on Tommy's personal trauma, the poor box office performance saw the franchise return to the masked murderer despite his aforementioned death. The aptly titled Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives, dropped the revelation that Jason survived his attack from Tommy. As it turns out, the very moment he was impaled, the metal post itself was struck by lightning, reanimating Jason and gifting him superhuman strength for some reason or another. Yeah, this one it really should have been left alone. Number 7. Vanessa was a fembot. Austin Powers, the spy who shagged me. Austin Powers was a character created to be the ultimate spoof of James Bond, and for the most part, he was. The diabolical villain, the gadgets, and even the sex appeal all echoed that of 007. However, Mike Myers' character did one thing that wasn't typically associated with Bond. While George Lazenby's version of the character did get married in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, which is like secretly the best Bond movie ever, his bride was killed on their wedding day, and it led to a pretty tragic ending. Austin Powers, though, after Dr. Evil's defeat in International Man of Mystery, married Vanessa Kensington, played by Elizabeth Hurley, and seemingly settled down to a life of marital bliss. Austin's happy ending was ripped away from him at the very beginning of The Spy Who Shagged Me, though. The sequel took the first movie's ending and completely retconned it in a way that only the Austin Bowers franchise could. It turned out that Vanessa had been a fembot all along, something that obviously makes no sense, but Austin Powers has never really been too concerned with that. This meant that Austin was forced to kill her, which then opened the door for Heather Graham to step into the love interest role as Felicity Shagwell, allowing the spoof to continue the Bond tradition of having a different woman by his side in every film. Number 6. Bond is suddenly an old man. Skyfall. From the fake Bond to the real Bond now, and while Skyfall is considered one of the best Bond films ever, looking back on it, you do kind of realize just how weird a sequel it actually is. Look, hear me out. Developed following the muted critical reception to Quantum of Solace, and designed as a celebration of the franchise for its big 50th anniversary, Sam Mendes' film deviated from the rookie Bond incarnation Daniel Craig had portrayed in Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace, and reconfigured him as a relic from a bygone era, no doubt as a means of meta-commentary to interrogate the role of Bond in a world far different to the one he debuted in during the 1960s. While this change works for Skyfall, which comes close to matching the highs of Craig's best effort, Casino Royale, it does jar slightly when you revisit these movies in order. 007 goes from a semi-grounded spy for the British government finding his feet as M's trusted operative to an aged, out-of-shape figure running out of time. Again, it's fine in the context of what Skyfall is, which has Bond in his mid-40s, but it does undermine the previous two incarnations. Not to mention the fact that it abandons the quantum storyline from the preceding movies, which of course led to all the weird retcons we got in Spectre. All in all, Skyfall is a fine celebration of Bond, but for Craig's Bond, it is a little weird. Number 5. K gets forced out of retirement. Men in Black 2. If you've been watching What Culture for a while now, then you'll know how much I love Men in Black. Firmly believe it's a perfect movie. An emotionally gratifying, gorgeously shot, and sharply written piece of genius that exemplifies the best qualities of 90s blockbuster cinema. It also ends on a truly brilliant emotional blow, allowing Tommy Lee Jones' K to retire and enjoy the life he sacrificed for MIB, with partner Jay, Will Smith of course, neuralizing him and becoming his replacement. But of course, MIB made a shed load at the box office and a sequel from that point was inevitable. Given so much praise was heaped upon the chemistry of stars Jones and Smith, it also made it somewhat inevitable that K would come back in some form or another. No one's gonna turn down more Tommy Lee Jones, especially not me. I don't even dislike Men in Black 2 as much as a lot of folks do, but there's no mistaking that it undermines the original's brilliant ending. 
Kay gets brought back, we find out he's living a boring life at the post office, and to add further insult to injury, we never even got to see Linda Fiorentino as an MIB field agent. These things are slightly cushioned by the fact we get to see Patrick Warburton cry while eating some pie, but none of it ever really hits the same as the original. Number 4. Brahms was a doll after all. Brahms the Boy 2. The boy had a great twist in 2016. After spending time in what seemed to be a house haunted by a doll, possibly possessed by the spirit of a young child, it turned out that the doll was just a doll, and the haunting was done by Brahms, played by James Russell, that same young child now grown up and living within the house's walls. Um, yeah, don't mind me, I'm just gonna go check on my own walls and, and make sure there's no no creepy things or goings on occurring there, because that wouldn't be good. Oh, okay, well I'm back and, and the walls are fine, it's great, we're all, we're all alive in here for the, for the time being. So back to The Boy 2, there just had to be a sequel released, and this one seemingly tried to one-up its predecessor in terms of shock value. This time, unfortunately, it missed the mark, mainly because it flew in the face of the original movie. Bram's The Boy 2, which is a really funny title the more I say it, followed a new family living in the same house as before, and after finding the same doll, strange things started to happen. With Bram's killed in the original film, this was gonna take some explaining, and the sequel went the way of completely ignoring and contradicting the man in the walls, instead confirming that his namesake doll was actually sentient and evil after all. Boo. Boo. Number 3. Michael wasn't actually killed. Halloween Resurrection. When the biggest draw and marketing asset for a movie is its villain, it becomes difficult to ultimately kill them off. I mean, just ask John Carpenter himself. He tried doing that with Halloween 2 and made a really cool anthology movie with Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, but the box office numbers weren't there because Michael wasn't around, and that of course gave us Halloween 4 and 5 and 6 and, well, you get the picture. This list has already delved into how Jason Voorhees was killed and brought back to the Friday the 13th franchise, but of course, he's not the only one. Jason is one of the most iconic characters in the entire horror genre, and right up there with him is a guy who just won't leave the picture is, of course, Halloween's Michael Myers. In Halloween H2O 20 years later, which ignored the events of Halloween's 4, 5, and 6, the long-standing battle between the villain and Laurie Strode, played here by Jamie Lee Curtis, again finally came to an end, with the latter decapitating her mass stalker who in this timeline is also her secret brother. Was it a perfect end to the story? No, far from it. But was it better than the direction the franchise took next? Um, yeah, I'm gonna go with yeah on that. Halloween Resurrection, as you would likely guess because the title is helpfully instructive, resurrected Michael with a shockingly insulting twist. As it turns out, Laurie didn't actually kill Michael, but instead an innocent paramedic who he managed to switch places with. He came back and killed the unsuspecting Laurie before himself getting defeated by Freddie Harris in what was Buster Rhymes' only franchise appearance. <laughs> Could you imagine if they brought him back for the new trilogy? Oh man, imagine how differently the ending of Halloween Kills would have gone then. Either way, like when Jason was brought back, would it not just have been better to let the character go at this point? Number 2. Judgment Day was only delayed. Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. Terminator 2 Judgment Day is widely regarded as one of the best action movies ever made, and is also one of the best sequels ever made on top of that. The movie pitted Linda Hamilton's Sarah Connor against not only the menacing T-1000, played to perfection by Robert Patrick, but the coming apocalypse itself as well. Along with her son John, played by Edward Furlong, and of course Arnold Schwarzenegger's T-800, Sarah found a way to destroy a key piece of technology required for Skynet to ultimately rise to power. By doing this, she actually avoided the titular Judgment Day, the day when the evil AI would have gained consciousness and incited nuclear apocalypse on the world. Because of what Sarah did, and the T-800 too, RIP my boy, she saved humanity. This was as happy an ending as she could have hoped for, and you could argue that the franchise should have ended right there and then. However, 12 years later in Terminator 3, please give us more money, oh, I'm sorry, Rise of the Machines, Skynet was still able to send Terminators back in time to kill John Connor. It turns out that Sarah only delayed Judgment Day, rather than stopping it completely as Terminator 2 would have had you believe. 
and this raises a few frustrating points. Namely, does it really matter what happens in the franchise if Skynet just keeps sending Terminators back regardless? Don't actions just begin to lose all sense of consequence or stakes when there is a built-in get out clause just waiting to happen? Again, not that anyone's asked me, but my solution for all this and to stop all this stupid Terminator sequel nonsense, and to be fair, it's something 2009 Salvation attempted, is to do away with retcons and different timelines and just say your movie is set in the war we see at the beginning of the original film. I don't think anyone should make that film, but I'm sure Terminator fans would appreciate a new entry that doesn't attempt to kill any of the characters from Cameron's genre-defining originals. And number one, no mention of any dinosaurs escaping, Jurassic World. The internet kind of broke with news of the revival of the Jurassic Park franchise in 2015. Led by the voice of Mario and Garfield himself, Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard, Jurassic World saw ridiculous success at the box office and kickstarted a brand new product placement filled franchise of its own. However, there was a huge question dangling over the end of the previous movie. Namely, the final frame of Jurassic Park 3 saw a group of pteranodons migrating and looking for a new home. Dinosaurs escaping into the real world came long before Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. And you know what? I'm gonna say it right now. Jurassic Park 3, better than any of the Jurassic World movies we ever got. I'm sorry, I'm just... I'm putting it out there. Anyway, the escaped migrating dino birds weren't mentioned once during Chris Pratt's first outing as Owen Grady. Not only that, but the movie seems to ignore the fallout and consequences of the Jurassic Park trilogy entirely. In spite of the dinosaurs escaping and the very public mess that was a Tyrannosaurus Rex running around San Diego in the Lost World, somehow InGen was able to get Jurassic World up and running with a strong portfolio of investors. Considering what came before it, this just shouldn't have been possible. 